Chapter 2 is our first meat and potatoes chapter, where we talk about the first of the five idle books called Service Strategy. In this relatively short chapter, we have five lessons. Lesson 1 is an overview of the Service Strategy book, in which we'll discuss the purpose of Service Strategy and also provide some Service Strategy related vocabulary. Lesson 2 is where we'll introduce Service Portfolio Management, which is the first of three Service Strategy processes that are required for the EIDL Foundation exam. In Lesson 3, we'll talk briefly about the financial management process, and we'll touch on some exam-related concepts. In Lesson 4, we'll introduce the process of demand management, which also has some new vocabulary to learn. We end our chapter with Lesson 5, which contains five sample questions to test your retention. Lesson 1 is our Service Strategy Overview. I like to begin each overview section with a shot of our life cycle ball, so you can see which life cycle phase we're currently in, where we've been, and where we're going. Here you can see that the Service Strategy phase is illuminated, while the other phases are grayed out, showing us that we're in our first phase. Service Strategy, you'll see, is at the center of our life cycle ball, which reminds us that no matter which phase of the life cycle we're in, we always have to keep our eyes and our minds on the strategy. To the right, we see a picture of the Service Strategy book, in case you want to pick up a copy at the bookstore. Lesson 1 has four main objectives. First, we need to learn how to discern between the concepts found in the Service Strategy book from concepts found in other phases of the service life cycle. Next, we'll understand the basic gist of the Service Strategy book. We'll also learn the deliverables, or outputs, of the Service Strategy phase for handoff to our next phase, which is Service Design. And we're also going to understand what value is, how to create it, how to calculate it, and how service assets contribute to its creation. Now, if you're a techie without much experience on the business side of things, some of this might seem a little esoteric. Don't be nervous. Just bear with me and it'll make sense, I promise. The Book of Service Strategy allows us to ask the big, important, long-term thinking questions. The word strategy means long-term plan, and if you look at this list of questions, you'll see that they all have that long-term planning feel to them. Let's take a look. What services should we offer, and to whom should we offer them? How do we truly create value for our customers, meaning how do we give customers what they want? How should we define service quality? And how do we resolve conflicting demands for shared resources? These are all big questions. Now, you don't need to memorize this list at all, but you should remember that when we're thinking about our strategy or our long-term plan, we need to think about why we're doing something before we get too excited about how we're going to do it. We'll save the how part for the service design phase of the life cycle. The Book of Service Strategy provides all sorts of guidance. It gives us direction on how we should start up and lead our IT service management initiative. It also provides helpful tips on how you can actually come up with a strategy. And we also try to get a handle on how much it actually costs to provide services through a process called financial management. We also try to figure out what it is our customers actually want by understanding what they consider valuable and how best to use our assets, also known as our resources and our capabilities, to provide services that customers actually want. Service strategy is also the phase of the life cycle where we set policies and objectives now that one's in bold, so you'll want to remember that one, especially for the exam. If you were to crack the Service Strategy book, you would find four main processes listed. You'd find Strategy Generation, Service Portfolio Management, Financial Management, and Demand Management. However, the exam syllabus only requires you to know about these latter three, so we're going to skip Strategy Generation in this Foundation Exam Video Mentor. Before we get into the three service strategy processes required for the exam, we should get a sense of where we're going. So by the time we're done with the service strategy phase, we should have a few deliverables in our hands. The first thing we'll need is a service portfolio. Now you don't know what a service portfolio is quite yet, but we'll talk about it in a moment when we get to the service portfolio management process, so sit tight. The other thing we'll need is a list of business challenges we're seeking to solve, or a list of requirements from the business. Now take note here that we're not coming with a list of functional requirements. Functional requirements tackle the question of how we're going to do something. Business requirements are just figuring out why we're doing something and what we're trying to accomplish. So let's not put the cart before the horse here. Let's give these two ideas a little bit of context. 
Pretend you're a lawyer and pretend that you and your buddies have just graduated law school. So you're sitting in a diner and you're talking about what you're going to do with your lives and you decide that together you should start your own law firm. Before you can open up your law firm, you have to, of course, come up with some long-term goals, a strategy. So you'll ask questions like, what kind of law firm do we want to be? What type of legal services will we offer? What part of town should we be located in so we can be the most convenient to our customers? How large do we want our firm to be? Do we want to be a small boutique firm or someday do we want to grow to be 50 or 100 or 200 lawyers? Where do we want to be in 10 years? How do we get there? What kind of stuff will our law office need to conduct business? Well, we'll probably need a nice location, some nice furniture, maybe a law library with some books. We'll need computers, printers, email, a website. We'll have to order some letterhead and business cards, that sort of thing. So you can see that right now we're asking the big questions. We're setting strategy. And since we're chatting about this in a diner, someone in your group is jotting down these ideas on a diner placemat. And these are your business requirements. And the list of services we as a law firm might offer is called our service portfolio. On an earlier slide, we mentioned that we have to understand what our customers want by figuring out what they feel is valuable. It only makes sense to provide services that our customers want. So chances are you've noticed that most chain restaurants, for example, don't have deep fried cockroaches on their menu because most customers don't want to eat that. Most chain restaurants have market research folks who figure out what it is that customers like to eat and eventually those are the things that stay on the menu. So at the top of this slide, we are reminded what a service is. And it says services are a means of delivering value to customers by facilitating the outcomes customers want to achieve without the ownership of specific costs and risks. Let's pretend that you're sitting at home and you're hungry, but you don't feel like cooking dinner. You go to a restaurant and you give the restaurateur some money and the outcome you receive is a full belly that is filled with hopefully a well-prepared meal that didn't cost you $53 million and someone else does the dishes. So how do we determine if the service this restaurant providing is actually valuable? Well, it takes a marketing mindset. If you listen to this list down below, you'll see that it sounds a lot like marketing speak. First, we need to analyze the attributes of the service. These are the features of the service that anyone can objectively jot down. Since we're talking about restaurants here, let's use Applebee's as an example. The attributes of Applebee's are, well, Applebee's is a chain restaurant which serves lunch and dinner and has a bar. It's not considered fine dining for the discerning palate, but it doesn't have a drive through a window either. It's a run-of-the-mill chain. Next, we have to take into consideration our customers' perceptions. Some customers might think that Applebee's is tasty, and others might think that Applebee's is too greasy. If we have a large advertising budget, we might be able to change our customers' perceptions. Next, we have to embrace that our customers may have some pre-established preferences, and chances are we can't do very much to change that. For example, some customers like to eat at restaurants with linen napkins and a sommelier, while others might prefer their food to be locally grown and organic, and some other folks just like a quick, unpretentious meal. Next on the list are the actual business outcomes, meaning what did the customer actually experience when they used the service? Some customers might say, Applebee's provided me a tasty meal for less than 15 bucks and we got it there in 45 minutes. It was terrific. And others might say, the server was snippy, I never got a refill on my iced tea, and it took 30 minutes for our appetizers to show up. And this is something the business has some control over. Lastly, we have the customer's self-image or their position in the market. Now a customer might say, I would not be caught dead in an Applebee's. Or another customer might say, Applebee's is where I meet my friends for happy hour. It's cool and the bartenders are cute. Or I'd rather eat at the bistro down the street, but Applebee's fits my budget a bit better. So for the exam, you'll need to remember that the items on this list are how the value of a service to a customer can be influenced. They all sound like marketing type stuff, as does much of the content of the service strategy book. Now that we know how to create value, we'll need to know how to calculate it. Value has two components, utility and warranty. The utility of a service means, does the service do what I need it to do? Do the service's attributes have a positive effect on the performance of activities, objects, and tasks associated with the outcomes I desire? Or 
easily stated, is this service fit for purpose? Does it do what I need it to do? The warranty of a service ensures that the service is available and usable when we need it, that it's dependable, that there will be enough of it when we need it, and that it'll be there in the event of a disaster, and that it's secure. Is this service fit for use? Meaning, is it usable? Will it be up and running when I need to use it? So let's apply this. Let's pretend you have a home improvement project going on and you need a hole drilled. Are you going to use a hammer or are you going to use a cordless drill? Well, you're probably going to use the cordless drill because that's a tool that is fit for purpose. It does what we need it to do. Why wouldn't you choose the hammer? Well, because it's not the right tool for the right job. In this situation, the hammer isn't as valuable to you as the drill is. Now let's apply this concept of utility plus warranty to the business. Let's pretend that you have an application that's terrific. It's easy to use, it's intuitive, it's quick, and it gets you the results that you need in a few short keystrokes. However, it's broken all the time. Now when it's up and available, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But when it's down, you can't use it at all. So would you say that this application has high utility or low utility? I'll give you a second to think about it. The answer is high utility, and that's because this application is great and it does what we need it to do. Now, would you say that this service has high warranty or low warranty? I'll give you another second. The service has low warranty because it's not reliable or dependable, so therefore it's not fit for use. So it has high utility, but low warranty. Now you'll need to remember this formula for the exam value equals utility plus warranty and that utility is fit for purpose which means does this service do what I need it to do and warranty means fit for use which means will this service be up and running or is it usable when I need to use it the way you can remember this in a pinch is utility starts with the letter U the word use as in fit for use starts with the letter U but the two U's, or the two U's, they don't go together. Okay, so utility starts with U, use starts with a U, but the two U's do not go together. Now I know that's kind of silly, but in the heat of the exam battle, you'll thank me. <laughs> and of course, if you can think of a better one, email it to me. And as I teach future classes, I promise to give you credit. What do organizations use to create value? They use their service assets. Well, what's a service asset? A service asset is anything that could contribute to the delivery of a service. Or, in Jill speak, a service asset is simply something that an organization has. And these things that your organization has can either be the tangible things that your organization owns or the intangible skills that your organization has. Now, in formal ITIL speak, service assets come in two flavors, capabilities and resources. Resources are the tangible things that your organization has or the tangible things that your organization can use to provide a service. Things like infrastructure, routers, switches, servers, or applications, or money, for example. These are all tangible things that you can poke. Now on the other side, we have capabilities. And capabilities are the intangibles or almost like skills, like the skill of management or the skill of organization. Now you'll notice that people fall into both categories, and that's because people have skills that are intangible, but people are tangible, people are pokeable. They may not like it, but you can poke them. We use our service assets to create value. We use our capabilities, our skills, to coordinate, control, and deploy these tangible resources. So we could manage our infrastructure, or manage our people, or we can organize our information. Now it's relatively easy to acquire resources as compared to capabilities. For example, you could walk into a computer store and you could buy a server, and that's a resource, but you can't really buy the knowledge to run it. Capabilities are developed over time. The thing also to remember about service assets and value is that it's often your capabilities, not so much your resources, but your capabilities that differentiate you from the competition. For example, if you're seeking a cup of coffee, you can either go to a gas station or a fancy pants cafe. Both of them serve coffee, 
coffee being the resource, it's the tangible aspect of the service. However, only one serves freshly ground, single origin coffee prepared by skilled baristas. So it's the skills of the barista and the quality of the coffee beans, which are both this intangible capability of an organization, that make most people agree that the cafe would serve better coffee. And better coffee is more valuable, which is why you'll pay two bucks for a cup of this fancy cafe coffee, but only 69 cents for a cup of gas station coffee. But the bottom line is the output is a cup of coffee.